turning now to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18 and verse 1. The book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila. And our subject this morning is unfolding providences. A remarkable record, among other things, in the first half or portion of this chapter of unfolding providences to the missionaries, to Paul, shortly to be joined by Silas and Timothy. And I'd like, first of all, then, to give you this heading of a foundation of faithfulness, because these unfolding providences came to the Apostle Paul as they come to all Christians in their faithful service of the Lord through faithfulness. And look at this first verse. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, where there had been blessing, and there had been a church established, but not a great church. Well, a great church, yes, but not great in size, quite small. That uh, idolatrous city, it was not to be that great blessing would be poured out in Athens at that stage. And Paul came to Corinth. He didn't fail in Athens. We spoke about that. And uh, it's very important to note this because some people have the theory, well, many people sadly have the theory that Paul failed in Athens and therefore he abandoned his method of simply preaching the gospel and uh, that he had uh, applied himself to in Athens. And when he came to Corinth, he behaved in an entirely different manner, and the idea is that there was less of the preaching and there was more miracle working, and so on. Well, that's uh, not the case. The fact is that Paul was absolutely faithful to his method, and preaching was the basis of his work in Corinth, just as it had been in Acts. This uh, theory uh, was built up in the late 19th century, actually by uh, people who were very cynical in the inspiration and infallibility of the scripture. But they started to note that the first verse of chapter 18 seemed to them a little dismissive of Paul's efforts in Athens. After these things, nothing to be said. Very few people noted or named as having been converted, but clearly more than those that are named. But here they say, Paul departed from Athens, he didn't stay there long, he hurried away, and it all implies failure. But then, when you look further down at verse 18, you find exactly the same language is used of Corinth. And Paul, after this, tarried there a good while and then took his leave of the brethren. There's no resume there of all the accomplishments. Some of the most notable converts, and indeed the first converts at Corinth, aren't even mentioned by Luke. The house, Stephanus and his household, for example, mentioned several times in 1 Corinthians, and a key person, the first to be converted, not so much as mentioned. And this is customary for Luke. In, when he moves Paul on, he'll use a conjunctive type of statement that actually says very little. It's not a, an indication that not much was accomplished. A great deal, we find, is accomplished in Corinth, and yet he moves on with the same quiet comment. So they shouldn't attach gloomy significance to chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens. A church had been established. It would not be as large by any means as the one to be established in Corinth, but it was not a failure by any means. It was not the will of God that there would be a great awakening in Athens. It was the prime city of idolatry in all Greece. And so there was to be a much more modest accomplishment given by the Holy Spirit there. But then when you look at uh, chapter 18, just one or two verses, uh, you look at verse 4, for example. 
Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And we've studied those words before. He reasoned, he argued his case in a stretched out manner, in a logical manner, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Tremendous words, which indicates his, uh, that he expostulated and uh, reasoned at length with them, proving that Jesus was the Christ and urging them to salvation. Same words, same method, same persuasive preaching in both places. And you can see it in other verses also. As he preached in Athens, so he preached in Corinth. But here's Corinth. He came, verse 1, to Corinth. The capital at that time of the Roman province of Achaia, that is Greece, the capital. Later, Athens would be so designated, but this is the Roman capital. As Athens was the cultural capital, so Corinth is the commercial capital and the legal capital. And he came to Corinth. Tremendous place for trade, sitting on trade routes for, with two ports and then the inland trade routes. It was Corinth that joined east to west. So it was a very rich city. It was a cosmopolitan city. All nationalities were there. It, because it was a rich city, it was also a poor city where there were many, many rich people and many gr rich Greek and Roman families. There would be many slaves. And so there were in Corinth. And the majority of the church at Corinth appear to have been, as we read in Acts and in the uh, uh, first and second epistles to the Corinthians, were slaves, the majority of people. So they came to Corinth. Well, we, you could describe us as a Corinthian church. Corinth, of course, was noted for architecture, as were all the big Greek cities. But the Corinthian interpretation of uh, pillars and pediments and porticos was the last and the most developed. And that's what we have at the front of the church. Corinthian fluted pillars, a Corinthian pediment, a Corinthian columns and Everything is Corinthian, and that was because when Spurgeon and others uh, came to this building uh, and this tabernacle was constructed, they preferred that it had a Greek front because Greek is the language of the New Testament and Greek was the language of the early church. And so they wanted Greek architecture on the front. So we're Corinthian in that sense. He came to Corinth a great deal of art and architecture and trade and so on. But it was an evil city. It was one of the most notorious cities for immorality in the ancient world. And the prostitution was uh, incorporated into its uh, temple worship, into its idolatry. It was such a lax city, morally speaking, well, if Athens was going to be difficult because of the intellectual snobbery, the idolatry there, yes, but also the great uh, fascination in Greek wisdom and philosophy, the need to be subscribing to all that. If Athens was going to be proud and resistant, how difficult would it be in Corinth, which was so lax and so immoral and such an awful place in that sense. Well, it would be very difficult, and yet by the power of the Spirit, there would be great blessing here. And I want to talk then just for a moment about Paul's faithfulness. He was utterly faithful to his charge, to his duty, to what God had given him to do. Let's turn for a moment to 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 2. And you can see Paul's, in the first six verses of chapter 2, you can see Paul's account of things and how he preached. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, 
which doesn't mean he didn't believe in persuasive preaching, the very opposite. It means he didn't adopt in Corinth any Greek wisdom or philosophy to tickle their minds and to attract their attention. He preached the gospel. It was gospel reasoning. Verse two, this is what he says. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. All his preaching was to persuade them in the case of the Jews that Jesus was the Christ promised and foretold for centuries. In the case of the Greeks, the Gentiles, to persuade them that there was one God and he was holy and we were alienated from him and we need a mediator to reconcile us to him. And Christ was that mediator who was God who came to suffer and to die for sinners. And verse three, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. There seems to have been considerable fear build up in Paul when he went to Corinth. Great anxiety, why he'd already suffered great persecutions on the way throughout the first and now the second missionary journey. Trials and tribulations, beatings, deprivations. He'd suffered it all, the hostility of Jews and Gentiles. And so there seems to be a mounting fear of people. His faithfulness, though, is manifested in it. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, emphasis on the man's wisdom, human philosophy, Greek teaching, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. How foolish! that some of the charismatic teachers should say, there you are, he didn't preach, he worked miracles. That's the method he used, and that's the method we want today. They don't read the passage. Look at verse four. And my speech and my preaching was not in this way, but it was in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The demonstration of the spirit and of power is not related to miracles, they're not mentioned here. It's related to the beginning of the sentence, and my speech and my preaching was in demonstration of the spirit and of power. If only they would read, they wouldn't make so many mistakes. He's talking very specifically about his style and manner of preaching, and his preaching was powerful. Is this a contradiction? I was with you in weakness, in fear and trembling. Oh yes, his speeching, his speech, his preaching wasn't outwardly powerful, but it was effectively powerful because the Holy Spirit brought hearts under conviction through it. While he was faithfully, persuasively preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit worked in hearts. There were miracles worked at Corinth, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about his preaching that he was faithful to. Anyway, back to Acts chapter 18 and uh, having established Paul's faithfulness, then we can go on to a second heading, which is these providences of God which began to flow. And the first providence involved fellow workers. Look at verse two of Acts 18. I must go much more quickly. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, which was a Roman province, lately come from Italy, in Rome that is, we learn elsewhere, with his wife Priscilla. Interestingly, Priscilla, after this chapter, is always going to be mentioned first because Aquila and Priscilla feature a lot in Acts and, in the, and, and subsequently, and we're going to find the order of the names reversed, the woman first. I'm not sure why that is. Some people say because she was of uh, much higher social standing. It's unlikely that Paul would defer to that. Other people say because actually she was much more prominent. She wasn't ever a preacher. Neither was Aquila come to that. But as Christian workers, 
it would seem that they were both all out for the Lord. But Priscilla was doing things which uh, made her much better known. And so perhaps that's the reason why she's mentioned first. But they weren't converted through Paul. They'd been evicted from Rome when the Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. And so they'd found their way to Corinth. And there, because by trade, as we're shortly told, they were tent makers, making portable tents out of leather and goat's hair cloth. Because they were tent makers, they settled a business in Corinth and proceeded to work. But what a remarkable thing that Paul should find them. We're not given any indication how, but he, perhaps he was looking before Silas and Timothy arrived on the scene. There was no support for him. There was no money. So the apostle worked with his own hands, as he did in many places. It was always his first resort. And in some places, he never did anything else but work with his hands alongside the preaching. So Paul became their employee. The apostle Paul, we put him on a pedestal and so we showed all that he accomplished, all the sufferings he endured, all the magnificent epistles that were given through his instrumentality by inspiration of God. We put him on a pedestal and he had the care of all the churches and prayed incessantly for them all and sent messengers and organized the workers of those days. And yet... He is content to be an employee at menial labor, tent making. What a grand character is the Apostle Paul. What extraordinary humility alongside his instrumentality and his significance in the church. But it's the providence I'm looking at. He had no idea when he got to Corinth that there was a home waiting for him and employment waiting for him until Timothy and Silas arrived with support and help. He had no idea that there would be fellowship, ready converted people, converted in the church at Rome. I won't go into the evidence for that right now because I'm proceeding too slowly already. But these are wonderful provisions. So it is with the servants of God. God doesn't lavish too much upon us. Look what he does for the Apostle Paul. A home, a job, companionship. Yes, but he's still got to work as well as pioneer and evangelize a missionary. God isn't too lavish. He doesn't spoil us. Don't think I'm saying to you like the prosperity gospel heretics, trust the Lord, be faithful to him and providences will reign from heaven and you'll be well provided for and have the kind of flat and house and circumstances and provision that you'd love and plenty beside. We're not saying that, but you'll have everything you need if you're faithful to the Lord. He knows how to keep you humble. He knows how to provide for his people when we're faithful. And you see this unfolding. The apostle, when he set foot in Corinth, had no idea that these provisions would come together. So he found Aquila and Priscilla and verse 3, because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. We you know that was a, a, an amazing thing that God had established in ancient times for the Jews, that the fathers would pass on their trade or their craft, their small holding, whatever, to their children. And even if the children became extremely well educated and went into, became intellectuals and teachers and all the rest of it, they all still had a fallback trade and could uh, practice it and carry on with it. And so the Apostle Paul, great intellectual as he was, trained in the Jewish law and so forth, yet he was taught to be a tent maker as a fallback craft and it came to his aid in all these places. But here's his work, verse four. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And he did that until Silas, verse five, 
and Timothy will come from Macedonia. Then there's an interesting phrase here. Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. I wonder if you've pondered that. It doesn't make a lot of sense as it reads on the surface, but Paul was already testifying to the Jews. Surely it doesn't imply that up to the arrival of Timothy and Silas, he'd left out Christ. That doesn't make sense, that's impossible. When Silas and Timothy would come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit. Not before. Why, he'd gone straight about his work, preaching in the synagogues, taking every opportunity. He was surely burdened in the spirit from the very beginning. Especially he'd, as he'd done it in the face of fear and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Well, I think the explanation and it's one of the oldest explanations, is that the sense intended in the passage is something like this. If you're looking at verse 5, and when Silas and Tip Timotheus were come from Macedonia, we need to insert, they found Paul pressed in the spirit and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now, in the Greek, that makes perfect grammatical sense. In our English version, it tends to read as though implying that Paul didn't wake up and speed up until Timothy and Silas arrived. But actually, the, the best sense is that Timothy and Silas came and found him in that state and condition, pressed in the spirit, burdened in the spirit, and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the promised Messiah. That, I'm sure, is the best sense, the intended sense. Paul didn't change at all in his manner or his attitude. What of us? If somebody has been away, somebody in your family, husband, wife, comes back home from a trip, from a journey, from business or something, how do they find us? just as they left us, earnest for Christ. Friend turns up who hasn't seen you for many years, remembers you as an earnest Christian when you were younger. How would he find you today? This is, I believe, the sense. As Silas and Timothy found Paul, pressed in the spirit and testifying. Same person, same enthusiasm, same zeal, same concern, always found consistently in that degree of faithfulness. But you read here in verse 6 about the Jews. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, of course they opposed Paul. But the phrase opposed themselves, the term mean, indicates that now they all stood together. The Jews in that particular synagogue, with a few exceptions, well, they pulled themselves together and they said, we want to be rid of this uh, preacher, this individual. They, his reputation had followed him, that he gained converts to Christ out of synagogues in all places. And they opposed themselves, you could render it better, together they opposed him. They stood as one against him and they blasphemed. Uh, that is to say they vilified Paul. They didn't blaspheme God. They may have done that too, but the sense of the Greek is that they vilified and attacked Paul, insulted him and opposed him. And so he shook his raiment, his garment. Well, that was a gesture. He's not in a bad temper. Paul was not resentful that they wouldn't listen. He's not irritated uh, by them to the extent that now he gives up on them. It's a gesture. He shook his raiment. The idea is you shake the dust off the hem or the bottom of your garment so that the dust remains as a testimony against them. It's a sort of gesture which says, look, the very dust of this place 
will witness to you that I tried to persuade you. I reasoned with you. I expostulated. I warned you. I encouraged you. I've done all I can think of to persuade you to see that Christ is Savior and your need of him and his great loving kindness and what he can do for you. And you won't listen. You hate him and you reject him. And that's the effect. When they opposed him together, stood together against him, well, obviously his time was up teaching them. They'd now all ganged up against him. So he ceremonially in that Jewish manner shook his garment and said, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles, which incidentally isn't once and for all. He's going to carry on his practice later on in other places, preaching to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. It means as far as Corinth is concerned, he's no longer going to preach to the Jews. They have rejected him. But there's a great challenge in this verse. Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. There are so many people. This is really challenging to us. For all of us, I'm sure, there are so many people to whom we should have witnessed and to whom we should be witnessing. And we put out of our minds the thought that we're responsible. And God will hold us responsible for saying nothing. Listen to the words again. Your blood be upon your own heads. This is from Ezekiel, of course. This is Ezekiel speaking of the watchman. If the watchman do not warn the city of the approaching enemy, then God will hold the watchman responsible for the loss of the city. I've warned you, says the Apostle Paul. I must call you to Christ and warn you. If you won't come, it's a matter of judgment and death, eternal punishment. Your blood, there are consequences. Be upon your own heads, but I am clean. In what way the Lord will reprove us, discipline us, punish us, withhold some blessing from us for our failing to speak to the people we should speak to and speak to and seek to win those near and close to us, I can't tell you. But there is some way in which we will be disadvantaged and disciplined through silence. I am clean, says the apostle. He lived under this responsibility all the time. Every city, every place he went to, he had a responsibility from God to speak. But here's another provision. This is now a, a provision of a meeting place. If he can't meet with the Jews and speak to them, where's he going? What's he going to do? Verse 7. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus. We believe that Justus is the same man elsewhere named Gaius. Titus, Justus, Gaius probably was his name. Again, I won't go into the evidence for that right now as I'm running so late, but uh, this is Justus in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, called Gaius, one of the first to be baptized. After the household of Stephanus, you have Gaius and the man in the next verse, Crispus, baptized. So that's probably who this is. Verse 7, this man's house joined hard to the synagogue. <clears throat> it was in the same terrace as the synagogue. It was a very ample house, a large house. So the, for the entire church in the apostles' time that was formed at Corinth had accommodation there, right next door. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God. He wasn't a Jew, 
He was a proselyte. He was a <clears throat> Greek-speaking man who had attached himself to the Jews and been admitted to the Jewish faith in some measure, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. He was one who had listened to Paul and been converted, and now they had a place to gather, and that must have maintained a continuing witness to the Jews that the Christian church was right next door. And another convert, verse 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue. Now he left and he believed on the Lord with all his house and many of the Corinthians hearing believed. It doesn't say many of the Corinthians as the charismatics would like it to say, many of the Corinthians seeing the miracles believed, many of the Corinthians hearing. Exactly the same method that the apostle always used, preach the gospel and people hear and the spirit applies it in their hearts and they're regenerated and converted. So now Crispus, the synagogue has lost its chief ruler. He believes with all his house. And uh, again, they'll say, children in that house, little children, infants baptized. Well, it can't be, because the text quite clearly says that his house believed. So the household of Crispus were all people at least sufficient, of sufficient age to believe for themselves. Not babies, believers baptized in the household of Crispus. And then comes another great provision. This is our subject, God providing for his people. Verse nine, the apostle Paul had a special kind of fear. He refers to it in 1 Corinthians. Things have mounted up, he's under great tension. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. Be not afraid, for I am with thee. Christ speaks, it's the Lord. Christ speaks to him. The very Christ who spoke to him on the road to Damascus, who appeared to him, now speaks to him in a vision, be not afraid, for I am with thee. He's a man of faith. He knows that Christ is with him. But now this is emphasized for him and applied to him in a special comfort because all the sufferings and the trauma that he's had and he almost shakes to go to yet another place to suffer so he might suppose the same problems. No, not in Corinth. The Lord says, for the next 18 months, it's going to be a time of positive service and no persecution. It wouldn't always be like that. Persecutions would arise again. But for Corinth, he's going to have a special dispensation and great comfort from the Lord. Then spake the Lord to Paul, be not afraid, but speak. And that's repeated in the negative form. Hold not thy peace. Don't be silent. Speak. Don't be silent. There will be continuous fruit. Every opportunity must be taken. I am with you. And no man, verse 10, shall set on thee to hurt thee. And then the reason for this special period of peace in Corinth, for I have much people in this city. Those people who would be saved were already in the mind of God. He had set his love upon them. He had given them to Christ in eternity past. Christ knew they were his. They were his elect people, predestinated from before the foundation of the world. For I have much people in this city. They're going to be saved through the instrumentality of preaching. 
Not a word here about miracles, though there were miracles at Corinth. Not a word is said. What's the instruction of the Lord? Speak. And then in a sense, repeated, and hold not thy peace. Speak and don't be silent, for I have much people in this city. It's all about soul winning by the gospel, by the reasoning, by the preaching. How can they say that Paul ever changed his method? And he continued there a year and six months, and then it's repeated yet again, teaching the word of God among them. This of all is the chapter that establishes the primacy and the necessity and the instrumentality of preaching. And yet, so poor is the standard of exegesis that the charismatics manage to teach their people that it's the chapter that says Paul abandoned preaching in favor of miracles. How can they possibly make that out of this? We must stick to God's infallible word. Well, here's another provision. Here's the promise kept. Trouble brews. Trouble suddenly starts. Verse 12. And when Gallio was the deputy, that is to say the proconsul, the Roman governor, proconsul of Achaia, that part of Greece, the Jews made insurrection. The Greek word means fierce hostility and opposition with one accord against Paul, just as they ranged themselves together in the Corinthian synagogue to get Paul evicted from teaching there. Now they arrange themselves together. This is a planned thing. We will go to the judgment seat. We will book time before the Roman governor and we will go to the judgment seat, a great elevated pavement in the center of Corinth with the great pillar bit, pillars behind it and so on. We will go there having given notice and we will charge him with crimes. And so Paul might in his heart be thinking it's going to happen all over again. Well, it would in the future, but not here. He's under a promise of God and a special provision. So with one accord, a great company of them, led by probably the leader of the synagogue, this is an assumption, but the man who is going to be hurt through this is the successor, I take it, to Crispus. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue in Corinth, has been converted. He's had to be replaced as leader of the synagogue. The man who replaces him, we read, is named Sosthenes. And he, in all probability, would have been the man who presented the case against Paul. So they bring him to the judgment seat. Verse 13, if Sosthenes, or an appointed orator, supported by him, would say, this fellow, fellow is in italics, but the original Greek implies just a man. He is a nobody. Paul is no one special. It's all done in a pretty insulting way. This fellow persuadeth, note that term. Paul is still a very persuasive preacher, even though fear and trembling. This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. What law? Well, their Jewish law, they mean. What does this mean? The Jews are complaining that their law is being broken by Paul in a Greek city under the Roman Empire. What's their law got to do with it? Well, it's, it's like this, that the Jews were tolerated by the Romans in Corinth. They'd been all expelled from Rome, but they were still tolerated in the provinces. And under the law of Rome, the Jews could teach they were, if you like, a registered faith, a permitted faith. And the case that the Jews are trying to put against Paul is this. You may think this man is one of us, but he isn't. What he's teaching is not allowed among us Jews. We say it's against our law. Therefore, 
he shouldn't get the recognition of Rome that is extended to us Jews. We say he's a heretic, and if he's not one of us, then he's no longer afforded the protection of a recognized religion tolerated by Rome. So you should deal with him. This is the case, I hope I put that plainly, that they make to Gallio. He's not one of us. He's teaching against our law. Of course he wasn't. It was they, the Jewish establishment, who'd left their own law. And Paul was teaching exactly in accordance with the Old Testament that Christ was the promised saviour, the predicted one. But that's their case anyway. He's not recognised by us, therefore he should be intolerable to you as a troublemaker who doesn't have any recognition at all. Well, Paul must have thought, this is all coming down on me once again. And he was just about to make his defense, verse 14, when Paul was now about to open his mouth, he didn't even get as far as opening his mouth. Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong, if you were bringing a real crime, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, it has nothing to do with me. I will not be a judge of these things. Deal with it yourself. Well, of course, they couldn't deal with it because Paul had already been put out of the synagogue. He was not of them anymore. That's the worst the Jews could have done, expelled him from their synagogue. They'd already done that. Well, what can we do against him? If you won't judge him, and we can't judge him, we've done all we can do in putting him out, that means he gets off scot-free. But Gallio wasn't interested. You bring crimes, not these complex religious matters. I'm not dealing with it. And you know, when you read between the lines here, verse 16 is fascinating. And he drave them, he drove them from the judgment seat. Why? Why did he have them rough handled and bundled out? Surely he wouldn't do that. Gallio might reject their case, but why bundle them out? Reading between the lines, they must have been hanging about. Sosthenes and the Jews must have been aghast that Gallio wouldn't listen. They must have been, as it were, but your honor, you must hear this. They were insisting. They wouldn't stand down. They wouldn't take his no for an answer. That must be the reason why in the end, the impatient governor Gallio said to the lictors, get them out of here, get them clear. And they were bundled out, driven out forcefully in a very undignified way. I think we can read between the lines. It wouldn't be normal for leaders of the Jewish community in Corinth to be ill-treated, but they're driven out. They're so stubborn and reluctant to accept the verdict. But just finally, look at this provision at the very end of the passage, the encounter, verse 17. Then all the Greeks... I wonder if you, you followed this in your Bibles. This is fascinating. All the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, in succession to Crispus, and beat him before the judgment seat. Why? The Jews being manhandled out from before the judgment seat suddenly seems, this is my view of it anyway, suddenly seems to have inspired the Corinthians who were there to express their anti-Jewish prejudice 
and to get the man who had presented the case and beat him up. So the Jewish leader of the synagogue, who had either presented or presided for the Jews in this, received a beating. And Gallio didn't take any notice. He wasn't interested in that commotion. He smiled within. It wasn't against Paul. It wasn't involving Paul or the Christians. Now, why am I mentioning Sosthenes? You may think, well, he got what he deserved. This man who was the enemy of Paul, this man who presided, or not presided, but rather led the Greek charge, the Jewish charge against Paul in Corinth. Well, it's very interesting when you go to First Corinthians, and I close with this in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul writes to the Corinthians, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Isn't that remarkable? This is four and a half years later, 1 Corinthians is written, and between the time that Sosthenes was an enemy of Paul, trying to get him convicted before Gallio, the Roman governor in Corinth, and the time four and a half years later when 1 Corinthians is written, Sosthenes has been converted. Sosthenes has changed. It must be the same Sosthenes. It's got to be. In this letter to the Corinthians of all people. And now he's a Christian worker. And he's in Ephesus with Paul at the time that 1 Corinthians is written. And he's laboring for the Lord. Isn't it remarkable? The blessings you get in Christian service. When sometimes your enemies are turned round and brought to the Lord. The provisions of the Lord. God helping his people time after time. Providential provision, a home, a craft, companions, Aquila and Priscilla. A place to meet right next door to the synagogue when you're thrown out because the man who owns that house next door is converted. Then others converted. Then the vision, the night vision, giving great assurance of Paul that nobody will lay a finger on him for all the time he's in Corinth. Unfolding providences. Do you have unfolding providences? Not riches, God not spoiling us, but in his service. If you live your life to serve him, you don't just come on Sunday mornings. You love him and you live for him. And you serve him and you pray to him. We as a church and as individuals will also know constant unfolding providences. That's our encouragement for this morning. Let's sing together the hymn number 200.